Well, hello friends and welcome to another Ask Zach. Today, I'm gonna look at 10 legendary Telecaster licks. And we're just gonna dive right in with lick number one. was Cornell Dupree's guitar part on uh, Rain Night in Georgia, performed by Brooke Benton and written by the great Tony Joe White. Uh, Cornell Dupree was from the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas, moved to New York City to work with King Curtis, went on to do sessions with, of course, Brooke Benton and Aretha Franklin and uh, you know many, many others, Donnie Hathaway. And he used a late 60s Telecaster, a maple cap neck uh, 67 or 68, uh, blonde, and used the neck pickup a lot. Later on, he would add a middle pickup in the early 70s, but uh, not, uh, not on those early sessions. That's a, a great example of textbook R&B guitar work in those uh, sliding you know, fourths and fifths and sixths and, and things like that. And uh, Cornell was one of the guys that helped uh, write the book along with, uh, you know, Bobby Walmack and Jimi Hendrix and others and, you know, Reggie Young and Steve Cropper. And I think they were all influenced by Curtis Mayfield. I think that was the influence, them trying to play his guitar parts uh, without using his uh, open tuning. Uh, I think they all kind of uh, stole from him. All right, lick number two. That was Reggie Young's guitar part on Memphis Soul Stew by King Curtis. So, funnily enough, uh, Cornell Dupree many times gets credit for playing that part, which he did live, but the part was created by Reggie Young and Reggie played the, you know, on the original studio recording. And Reggie played uh, same, probably about a 1966 Maple Cap uh, Telly that had a transition logo on it into deluxe reverb. And uh, yeah, great sound. All right. Reggie, of course, would go on to play on all sorts of R&B sessions in the 60s and then started playing on pop sessions with Elvis and stuff in 69. And uh, then would move to Nashville in the early 70s and play with everyone and their dog. Uh, one, one of the all-time greats. All right, lick number three. All right, that was Susie Q by Dale Hawkins featuring a young James Burton on guitar. Uh, James you know, was from Shreveport, Louisiana and played a 52 telly and probably into a small like you know epiphone or you know some little amp uh, i don't think he had a fender yet and uh, i played this instead of probably many of the other things just that james has done through the years uh, just to showcase the blues influence uh, james was very influenced by lightning hopkins and uh, suzy q sounds like a lightning hopkins lick uh, and if you haven't listened to Lightning Hopkins, I highly suggest you listen to him. And uh, if there were one like album, it would be the Herald Sessions. And uh, Rick Holmstrom from uh, Mavis Staples Band uh, told me about this album. And it's great. He's uh, Lightning's playing electric guitar and uh, there's a lot of echo on it and such. And it's a, a great sounding album. So check that out. All right. Lick number four. Look number four was played by Jesse Ed Davis uh, on the Taj Mahal track Six Days on the Road off the Giant Step album. Uh, Jesse Ed is an incredibly important guitar player, incredibly influential. Uh, 
because of his slide work on Taj Mahal's version of Statesboro Blues, Dwayne Allman picked up slide and in fact stole all of his licks off, off that tune. And of course, that was the Allman Brothers' signature song and how they opened the show. Uh, so Taj Mahal and Jesse had were huge influences on, uh, on the Allman Brothers. Also, you have what Jesse Ed did on the song Six Days on the Road, which this was kind of a rock blues album, and this was a gateway drug to tons and tons of rock and blues, you know, pop guitarists that heard the album, and that was the first time they had heard that type of bending and playing, and it made a lot of guys get into uh, country music and country guitar styles and mix that in with their rock playing. Uh, a great uh, example of that is Elliot Easton, who is, is, you know, was and is a big fan of Jesse Ed, and that influenced his solos uh, that he played in the Cars, especially things like "My Best Friend's Girlfriend," um, you know, and other songs where you can hear kind of that country influence and pedal steel type bends. Also, you have the pinch harmonics that he's that he's doing, and uh, of course, in the solo, he even plays some kind of stereotypical thing. <laughs> Again, you know, you know, very country influenced work. Uh, he used the neck pickup a lot, which that's what I was using there. And he played a late fifties Telecaster, a top loader, uh, meaning the strings did not go through the body. And uh, that was the guitar he played throughout his entire career, uh, his professional career. Uh, uh, well, I guess in the end he had a made in Japan telly, but but uh, the guitar was finished many different colors, and so at times it had kind of a flowery appearance, and then. Uh, by the time the you know, like concert for Bangladesh, it was uh, it had been refinished, sunburst, and had a Strat neck pickup by that point. But it had a normal neck pickup, you know. When of course he played uh, Six Days on the Road, and that was neck pickup probably through. He was a big fan of a Vibrachamp uh, to record with, and then live, he used a 410, a 50s 410 basement loaded with JBL speakers, and then of course you know big. Outdoor gigs, you might use a dual showman or, or, or something bigger than that, or SVT. And uh, used light gauge strings, 9 through 42, and a heavy gauge pick. Just an incredible player. All right, lick number five. <laughs> was Pete Anderson's guitar part on Dwight Yoakam's uh, Guitars, Cadillacs, and Hillbilly Music. Uh, that was released in 1986 and was a huge record. Uh, country music had gone to uh, strats and chorus pedals and uh, things of that sort and plugging in direct. And uh, Pete Anderson was playing a Telecaster into deluxe reverb and he was playing low string twangy stuff and he turned country music on its ear by showing what it had done in the past, especially out of country, out of California. So that song uh, is a tribute to Bakersfield and uh, California country music. And uh, Pete was another guitar player very influenced by Jesse Ed Davis. And he mentions uh, Six Days on the Road as influence, influencing him to uh, switch from blues, which he had mainly been a blues player, to learn about uh, country music and such. So there you have it. All right, lick number six. That was Bobby Womack's guitar part on the uh, tune I'm in Love, as recorded by Wilson Pickett. Now, the tune also features Reggie Young, but uh, Reggie is playing a lower part that... That kind of thing. But uh, what I was playing was Bobby Womack's guitar part. And Bobby Womack was a very important writer. Of course, he wrote that song, I'm in Love and was a great artist, 
Uh, if you want to dig deeper into him, uh, listen to his album, Fly Me to the Moon. Great Telecaster player. And it was Reggie, Reggie Young's work that got him to play a telly. And again, this was, you know, mid to late 60s. And so, uh, you know, Bobby Womack played a 67 or, or 68 maple cap telly on a lot of sessions with Aretha Franklin and Wilson Pickett on his own records and used uh, Fender or Ampeg amps. Great player. All right. Lick number seven. I think for this one, we're going to switch guitars. All right. That was Clarence White's B-Bender Telecaster work on You Ain't Going Nowhere as recorded by the, the Birds. And that was, of course, what he would play on, on, the, uh, on the live versions. The studio recording featured uh, Lloyd Green playing pedal steel guitar. But of course, when they played it live, they didn't have a pedal steel player, and which uh, left a great opening for uh, Clarence to use his uh, B-Bender, which he did to great effect. Of course, Clarence uh, would have been uh, legendary if he had never picked up the electric guitar. Just his work on acoustic guitar um, yeah, helped bring it out as a lead instrument where it had mainly been a rhythm instrument in bluegrass music. He and Doc Watson uh, really pushed the acoustic guitar as being a solo instrument. And of course he was a huge influence on Tony Rice and Tony Rice played one of his guitars for most of his career. Um, Clarence was, you know, you know, inspired to pick up electric guitar by James Burton, and in fact was very James Burton influenced. But he, uh, you know, he also had his bluegrass, you know, style, and also his unique sense of syncopated rhythms and uh, just the feel that he had. And then when you add the string bender in, he had a completely unique style. He used a '54 Tele that, of course, it had a B bender added, and then later on it had a Strat neck pickup, and. Uh, yeah, used very light gauge strings, kind of like 9 through 42, but used, you know, maybe a, a 13 for a G string and a 10 or 11 for a, for a B string. Uh, such, such an amazing player. All right, we're going to switch back. Lick number eight. All right, that was a doozy. That's uh, Highlander Boogie by John Jorgensen, as recorded with the Helicasters. John played a Made in Japan JV uh, telly, uh, sunburst with white binding, rosewood fretboard into a Vox or matchless amp. Maybe used a Boss reverb or delay. Um, and that's you know a, a song that he wrote, and I actually saw him perform it uh, without the Helicasters before the Helicasters were uh, you know recorded it. Uh, on a Nashville television show in the very early 90s, and just as a trio, himself, bass player, and drummer. And it was ridiculous. Hearing that song, you know, even with just one guitar, bass, and drums, sounded so big and so full. And it, of course, it, you know, it's an amazing guitar part. Really, uh, you know, not, not the, the easiest thing to play, not the easiest thing to pull off, and I did my best there. So, but uh, yes, Highlander Boogie is one of the great Telecaster instrumentals. Uh, Ridiculously good. All right, lick number nine. That was Luther Perkins' guitar part on Folsom Prison Blues, uh, written and recorded by uh, Johnny Cash, and I guess it was the Tennessee Two still at that point. Uh, Johnny and Luther Perkins and Marshall Grant, uh, they uh, they were all 
you know, uh, met at a, a car dealership in Memphis where some of them were working and they started playing music together in their living rooms. And then they, you know, recorded it at Sun Records and had uh, Hay Porter. And then they recorded uh, Folsom Prison, which is, uh, you know, a fantastic song and a, and a really amazingly wonderful but simple guitar lick that really has stood the test of time. Unlike songs like, you know, Smoke on the Water or Stairway to Heaven, which you know, people uh, really, you know, start gagging on. I think uh, Folsom Prison, uh, the opening look to that is just so cool and iconic that uh, it hasn't, uh, it hasn't worn out its welcome. So uh, that's look number nine. And uh, Luther played a telly, uh, well, he played an Esquire, uh, or a 50s Esquire, and uh, probably with the stock strings, which were like 12 through 52 with a wound third. And he played that boom chicka style. And, uh, it was great, perfect for uh, Johnny Cash's uh, you know, songs he had written. All right, here is lick number 10. James Honeyman Scott's guitar work on Kid by the Pretenders. You might be surprised that I had that on my on my list, but uh, uh, the Pretenders are one of my favorite, you know, pop bands. And James Honeyman Scott was one of the great pop guitar players of all time. So good, so melodic, uh, great parts. And he played that on a telly. He played that on uh, Rosewood Board '66 uh, telly that was owned by Chrissy Hind. He plugged it in direct and recorded. Uh, all those great parts, the great intro and that amazing solo. That's one of the uh, one of my favorite solos of all time. All right, well that's my ten legendary licks, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you have been enjoying the show, I hope you will subscribe. Also, uh, you know, if you've already subscribed, I hope you will support the show. We have uh, multiple ways. There's tip jar information in the description. And there, uh, you can go to askzack.com and you can pick up a shirt like this, uh, you know, amp blueprint or a, or a mug. Also, there's friends of Ask Zach to support me on a monthly basis, and I'm really appreciative of everyone that's done that. Okay, if you've made it through all this, you get a bonus lick. All right, here we go. Uh, this is from a player that I recently interviewed, and I really think that uh, a hugely influential guy. So I'll just go ahead and play it. All right, and that was our honorary 11th, which is Jimmy Olander and his Telecaster work with uh, Diamond Rio on their first single, Meet in the Middle, which went straight to number one on the country charts in 1990. Uh, of course, Jimmy used a double bender, and uh, that lick used to always, uh, I just thought it was impossible to play. And then when I interviewed him recently for the True Tone Lounge, he said it was possible to play it without benders, and uh, so I figured it out. And uh, I used open strings and, and manual bends, but uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. All right, and I'll, also for those that made it to the end, I'm gonna tell you about this guitar. This is a 1957 Esquire. It, the body has been refinished. And, uh, and of course a neck pickup has been added and I'm using, um, I'm still uh, trying these out. These are Gabriel Tenorio strings and these are uh, pure nickel round, uh, round core strings and uh, they're very nice sounding. I'm still kind of testing them out and I'm using a uh, blue chip TPR 35 uh, pick and uh, this is my 1965 Deluxe Reverb that has a Mesa Boogie version of the uh, Celestian Vintage 30. And the bright cap has been clipped and I was not using any type of effects of any kind. And I was just straight into the amp and then I switched over for the Clarence White 
segment, I switched over to this uh, Crook Tele. It's Paisley and it has a, uh, a new Joe Glazer bender on it. And it's a great guitar. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.